Introduction to Venus Boy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Introduction of Venus Boy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Venus Boy by Lee Sutton, a hero of Venus. If you ever make a trip to the green planet of Venus, the first thing you'll see will be a 50-foot-high statue of Venus' greatest hero. It stands on the very top of towering New Plymouth Rock, at the edge of the old colony of New Plymouth. Even from the rocket cradle, anyone can tell that the statute is of a twelve-year-old boy smiling up at the Venusian jewel bear perched on his shoulder. Cut into the huge rock below the statue are the words, Virgil Dare Johnson watson and the marva baba may their friendship endure virgil dare watson called johnny by his friends was the first human being born on venus he was named after virginia dare the first pioneer child born in north america and for a long time he was the only child on all venus and that would have been a lonely thing to be if it had not been for baba baba the bear was not only johnny's pet but his best friend too and the only one who knew about his three secrets because of these secrets johnny got himself his jewel bear baba and the whole colony of new plymouth into desperate trouble and because of these secrets he also became a hero worthy of a statue venus greatest hero end of introduction of venus boy chapter one of venus boy this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Venus Boy by Lee Sutton Chapter 1 The First Two Secrets It was rocket day on Venus, the day the yearly rocket from Earth arrived, and it was like Christmas, Fourth of July, and your birthday all rolled into one in the windowless one-room new plymouth school johnny watson a stocky twelve-year-old sat toward the back of the room a big venus geography propped up in front of him johnny was supposed to be studying every time mrs hadley the teacher glanced his way a page of the book slowly turned the teacher was much too busy with the half-dozen squirming, excited first-graders to notice that a small black paw fastened to a furry blue arm was really turning the pages. On Jenny's lap sat Baba, a perky-faced little blue bear with stand-up ears and bright blue eyes. To fool the teacher, the little bear his eyes twinkling, flipped the pages one by one. We gotta do something quick, Baba, Johnny whispered to his bouncing jewel bear cub in a tight, worried voice. It's only two hours till school's out. The little bear peered over at the clock on the wall. He lay a tiny black paw on his blue button nose and cocked his head as if he were trying to tell the time when school was out 
everyone would go to the rocket field. Johnny knew that above all, he and his bouncing bear must not be there. Why Johnny and Baba dared not go was one of Johnny's three secrets. There was only one thing to do, Johnny thought. He would have to behave so badly that, as punishment, he would be forbidden to go. Nudge me when Mrs. Hadley turns around, Johnny whispered. We're going to get out of here. The little bear shoved his furry blue snout around the geography and peered from behind it. His bright eyes followed every move the teacher made. The instant Mrs. Hadley turned to write on the blackboard, Baba gave the boy a kick. Johnny slipped down onto his hands and knees in the aisle, and Baba hopped upon his back. Rapidly and silently, Johnny crawled toward the armored door. Behind him, a little girl kindergartner began to diggle. Look at the horsey, she yelled. Johnny heard the teacher call. Quiet, children. The little girl giggled louder, but he hadn't been seen. He scurried into the armor room. As Johnny jumped to his feet and grabbed for his suit of rhinosaur hide armor, Baba leaped toward the wall and hooked his claws into the concrete. Then he scurried straight up the wall like a fly and snatched up Johnny's head globe in his tiny black paws. While Johnny wriggled into the armor, Baba fitted the head globe over the boy's toe head. Without waiting to zip up, Johnny started toward the door. Baba jumped from the head globe shelf and landed on his shoulder with a smack. The boy's hand was scarcely on the latch when the teacher turned around, her mouth making an O of surprise. Quickly, Johnny jerked open the door and dashed through, slamming it closed. There was a space of a few feet and then another door. Holding the second door open, Johnny snapped tight his head globe while Baba's small fingers pushed and pulled at the zippers fastening the armor. Both of them scanned the sky. No arrow birds. Johnny grabbed a stone from beside the step and wedged it in the outer door so it could not close. To keep out these murderous flying lizards, all buildings were windowless and had double doors. When one door was open, the other automatically locked. Johnny, Johnny, you come right back here, a muffled voice called. Johnny sighed regretfully as he slipped out of the schoolhouse into the pearly green light of Venus. Baba on his shoulder, he started out at a dead run through the collection of windowless buildings that made up colony headquarters. The two had barely made it to the foot of a tall, heavily leafed tree when the door of the main headquarters building began to open. Up the meat tree, Johnny yelled. Baba leaped from Johnny's shoulder and rolled himself into a furry blue ball as he fell. The little bear smacked the ground with the sound of a bouncing basketball and bounced high into the air. At the top of his bounce, his arms and legs shot out. He hooked his claws into the trunk halfway up the meat tree. Baba wasn't calling a bouncing bear for nothing. Johnny jumped for the nearest branch. Weighed down by his arrow bird armor, 
He was slow pulling himself up. Too slow. Baba scurried down the trunk like a squirrel, his claws scattering bits of bark on Johnny. Hanging on with three paws, he reached out and hooked his claws into Johnny's armor. One pull from that tiny but powerful arm, and Johnny was sitting on the branch. From there up it was easy. The branches made a perfect ladder. Soon they were entirely surrounded by green shadowy leaves. Johnny carefully pushed aside a green fruit the size of a cantaloupe and looked out. Striding across the dusty road came a tall man in headglobe and black armor, Captain Thompson of the Colony Guard. The teacher must have phoned for help. The man's square face was set in anger as he kicked the rock away from the schoolhouse door. The teacher stepped out, and Johnny could hear their angry voices. After a moment, Mrs. Hadley went back inside, and the guard captain strode purposefully away toward Mayor Watson's office. Sitting on a branch, swinging his legs, Baba winked a shiny blue eye. He reached over and patted Johnny on the spot where the boy was likely to pay for his pranks. I think we've done it this time, Johnny whispered. I hope it's not just another spanking. Johnny spoke with deep feeling. He had had three spankings in three days. The little bear looked sadly down his blue muzzle and made an odd deep clicking noise in the back of his throat. Sure, Johnny said as if answering the bear's clicks. I want to go to the planet fall, but we just can't. The bear clicked again. I know, Johnny went on, I know the earthies would give you chocolate. Besides, I was going to have a job. Johnny's eyes began to shine with tears he wouldn't let come. For the first time, he would have been working on the rocket field with the men instead of being on the sidelines watching with the women and the little kids. The little bear patted him on the shoulder and clicked in low tones. All right, I won't be sad if you won't. Johnny shook the tears away and tried to make a joke. Gosh, Baba, you talk funny since you know what. Johnny screwed up his face. You're such a mush mouth now, I can hardly understand what you say. Baba stuck out his long blue tongue. This was Johnny's first secret. His little bear could talk. Baba's clicks were really the words of his own language, although he couldn't make the sounds of the human voice. He could understand people perfectly. Johnny could both understand what the bear said and speak in the same clicking language. This hadn't started out to be a secret at all. As a little boy, Johnny thought everyone knew that those clicks were Baba's words. When Baba came to live with him, the little bear cub already knew his own language, but Johnny was just learning to talk. He learned human words and click words at the same time and thought everyone understood them. When he was almost five, Johnny discovered, to his amazement, that no one understood Baba but him. He then went proudly spreading the news that he and his bear could talk together. When the first person laughed, Johnny didn't mind. When, when everybody laughed at him, he began to get a little mad. The crowning insult was being spanked for lying. After that, Johnny decided if telling grown-ups 
that Baba could talk only got him licked and laughed at, it might as well be a secret. Besides, it was fun keeping it secret. After a few minutes of waiting, Baba scurried along a branch and hung by his black claws while he thrust his blue button nose through the twigs and leaves. Johnny followed along another branch. Looks clear, Baba clicked. Let's go. Wait a minute. A quick movement in the distance caught Johnny's eye. Four men came out of a long gray building marked Hunter's Hotel. Johnny was instantly alert. Colonists always kept a sharp eye on such men. These were the dangerous Marva hunters, whose only law was an atotube gun. Johnny swung to a branch where he could see better. What's up? Baba clicked. Hunters clicked Johnny. They're watching the guard change at the old stockade. Oh, the two looked at each other. Both knew what was in the stockade, locked away in the big safe. Marva teeth and claws, jewel claws and teeth from grown-up bears just like the cub Baba. Come on, Baba, Johnny shinnied back to a place where branches forked from the tree of the meat tree. We'd better check your nails before we go down. After making sure no arrow birds were feeding on the meat fruit, he undid one of his armor zippers and pulled a bottle of black liquid and a small brush from an inside pocket. Baba plopped down on his lap smile johnny commanded baba pulled back his lips showing black teeth johnny looked at them carefully grunted and then picked up one of the little bear's paws all the nails seemed perfectly black but on the tip of one of them there sparkled a point of bright blue dang it we got to find something better than this nail polish. A little climbing and it's all scraped off. Johnny scowled and dipped the little brush in the bottle of black liquid. Carefully, he painted the tip of the claw. Looking over the little bear's paws, he found four more claws that showed blue. He painted them, too. Now don't climb down when we go. When the polish is dry, jump. The little bear nodded. This was Johnny's second secret. Everyone thought Baba still had his valueless black baby claws and teeth, but under the coating of black nail polish, each of Baba's claws was really a precious blue jewel. Johnny Watson owned a million dollar pet end of chapter one chapter two of venus boy this librivox recording is in the public domain venus boy by lee sutton chapter two the treasure of venus yes a million dollars, maybe even more, and all for one little bear. Johnny sighed shakily at the thought and hugged his bear to him. What's the matter, Johnny? Baba clicked, waving his claws to dry them like a lady getting ready for a party. You know, Johnny said, I was just wishing for the good old days when you had your baby black nails and your pretty squeaky voice and we didn't have to be afraid of anything i'm sorry baba clicked i couldn't help it i just grew baba looked so sorrowfully down his nose that johnny laughed 
swung the little bear up above his head and sat him down on a branch. You're a silly, Johnny said. I know you couldn't help it. I was just wishing. Most of all, he was wishing that bouncing bears didn't have jewels for claws at all. But he knew that was a silly wish, too. Grabbing a branch, Johnny swung himself back to a spot where he could see the hunters. As he watched, more were arriving. About a mile away, a battered hunting tank came lumbering through the sliding doors of the fifty-foot-high concrete wall surrounding the colony. Outside those walls, Johnny knew, lay the murderous animal life of the jungle planet. Every living thing on Venus attacked men, not just the huge rhinosaurs and the horned river snakes, but even tiny scarlet apes and pygmy antelope. Johnny knew the colonists and hunters would never have come to such a savage place at all without the lure of the tremendous wealth to be made from bouncing bears' claws. Harder than diamonds, and just as clear, these magical jewels shone soft blue in the night and were blindingly bright in the sun. But that wasn't the only reason claws were valuable. A tiny piece of claw, or even of the duller teeth, melted in thousands of tons of plastic, made that plastic tough enough to be used for the hulls of rocket ships. Men called it marvaplast. With such a treasure beckoning, man could not stay away from Venus. Rockets came hurtling across space, filled with hunters. Traders followed. After the traders came the colonists, led by Johnny's father and mother. Johnny sighed again. Don't be so sad, Baba clicked. We've been real lucky so far. I suppose so, Johnny had to admit. They'd both been lucky. Baba had been lucky not to be killed as his mother and brother had been, and Johnny had been lucky to get Baba at all. If there had been any other way of raising the bear until his black baby claws turned blue, Johnny never would have gotten him. All other young marva that had been captured had died. They refused to eat or drink. They simply squatted down and whimpered piteously until they died of what seemed to be loneliness and heartbreak. When Baba had been captured, Mrs. Watson brought him home, hoping to save his life. Two-year-old Virgil Dare, as Johnny was called then, was fascinated. Baba, he had cried trying to say bear, and had thrown his arms around it. Surprisingly, the little bear had stopped whimpering and had hugged Johnny back. A few minutes later, it had eaten some diamond wood nuts. After a week, the colonists had decided that the little bear would live, and he was taken away and put in a small diamond wood cage for safe keeping the little bear promptly refused to eat and almost died whimpering over and over a sound that was just like johnny 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 it was the only sound he could make beside the clicking noise he had to be sent back to the little boy from then on virgil dare was called Johnny. He and Baba went everywhere together, even to school. As the years went by, they became closer than brothers, and it was easier and easier to forget that the blue cub was really 
colony property then baba's voice had deepened the black nails had gradually loosened and all in one venus night during baba's long sleep through five earth days of darkness the new nails had come in johnny had a mixture of india ink and nail polish all ready it had worked for two months now but the polish did chip off and the claws had to be painted over and over oh baba why can't you be a sensible little bear and stay home where people can't see you johnny said you know why johnny baba clicked you're my kickack this was a word in the clicking language that meant friend pet and brother all in one baba said kickacks should never be parted that was the reason johnny could not go to see the rocket come if he went baba was sure to follow everyone colonists and hunters was going to be at the field and if one of them caught sight of a flash of blue from baba's claws it would mean the end of baba the colonists liked the little bear but the colony was very poor they wouldn't think long about killing him for his jewel claws the hunters wouldn't think at all they would steal him as quick as the flight of an arrow bird it was a very dangerous situation but if he could keep from going to the rocket field johnny had a plan the plan depended on johnny's third secret draped over his branch johnny kept his eye on the hunters they just seemed to be strolling about the settlement now getting used to the fact that they were out of the dangerous jungle where they lived in concrete forts when the door of the settlement headquarters opened again johnny pulled his head back in among the leaves a gray-haired man with heavy eyebrows stepped out of the door it was jeb the old hunter one of the first men to come to venus hunting marva now he was one of the colony guards and a very good friend of baba and johnny when the old man came close enough for him to hear johnny crawled out where he could be seen calling down to him and waved hi jeb what you doing the old man stopped in his tracks looked carefully around him then cocked an eye up into the tree he frowned his gray eyebrows making a v over his deep-set eyes he shook his head in disapproval but said nothing until he was directly under the tree what i'm doing isn't important jeb said in a gruff voice looking up at johnny but what are you a doing up that tree when you're supposed to be doing bookwork ah uh, johnny started i just you just made your paw boiling mad that's what jeb interrupted locking the teacher in that way he snorted did dad say anything about keeping me away from the rocket landing johnny demanded anxiously nope answered jeb captain thompson wanted him to but he says no that you worked real hard all year but i'm warning you you better get on inside that schoolhouse unless you want a good tannin your mom's out looking for you with fire in her eye he started to walk away hey wait a minute jeb johnny called well i was watching those hunters they're sure interested in the stockade you better tell captain thompson we know they're interested i don't think they'll do anything that old reprobate of a traitor harkness'll keep em in line you'd better watch out though i might tell captain thompson where he could find him a hooky player 
with a fierce snort the old man was on his way johnny smiled he knew jeb would never tell where he was hiding in spite of the gruff warnings jeb was a nice old fellow he'd shot his marva years before gone down to earth spent his millions in a few wild years and returned to venus dead broke in twenty years hunting he had never made another kill marva were as hard to find as they were valuable guess you just weren't quite bad enough baba clicked to johnny my claws are dry let's go before your mother finds us johnny crawled down to the little bear we got to think of something else bad to do it's that or just plain refuse to go but then they'd think something was funny sure as shootin there's lots of ripe meat fruit in the tree baba clicked and grinned maybe you could drop one on captain thompson oh boy johnny exclaimed in excitement then he frowned ah oh, he probably won't come by here again somebody will baba said let's keep an eye out the two of them posted themselves in different parts of the tree and watched for possible targets for ripe meat fruit no one seemed to want to walk under the tree finally johnny caught sight of a short fat bald-headed man and a tall red-haired man leaving the hunter's hotel together one was trader harkness who all but ran the colony and the other his bodyguard rick saunders they seemed to be headed for the trading post and would have to pass directly under johnny's tree to get there baba saw them at the same time how about trader harkness the little bear clicked do you think he'd be a good target a kind of dangerous one johnny clicked back his heart racing but where's that meat fruit there wasn't any question about his getting into enough trouble this time he just hoped he wouldn't get into too much trouble trader harkness was a very important man but johnny didn't like him he had started as a hunter and then had turned trader by killing off most of his opposition he had become the only important trader on venus if he hadn't wanted a walled settlement to protect his goods the colony might have failed a hunter would stop at nothing to get what he needed and the colony had had more than one of its tanks ambushed and stolen to hunt marva a red ripe meat fruit was not hard to find johnny wrenched one from the branch and held it carefully by its long stem the size of a small melon green meat fruit must be cooked before eating once ripe their thin skins are plump full of sweet strong smelling paste a natural high protein baby food there's plenty more johnny clicked softly think we ought to get rick too he's too good a friend baba clicked back besides he might not give me any more chocolate johnny agreed with a laugh and pushed leaves aside so he could see he shivered below him came the most powerful man on venus a short immensely fat man who waddled forward rather than walked on earth he would have been laughed at but on venus he was feared and respected he liked that respect and demanded it johnny swallowed hard the man he was going to drop the fruit on had once been ambushed by five hunters none of them had survived 
End of chapter two. Chapter three of Venus Boy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Venus Boy by Lee Sutton. Chapter three. A Dangerous Target. As the two men moved closer to Johnny's and Baba's meat tree, they appeared to be arguing about something. The trader glittered as he waddled forward. His armor was of the clearest, brightest marva plast plastic, and his fingers were studded with marva jewel rings. They stopped just a few feet away from the tree. Johnny could tell the trader was angry, though he was keeping himself under tight control. His heavy jaw was set, and his little black eyes flashed under his smooth, hairless brow. I'll put it to you straight, Rick, the trader's heavy voice rumbled up to Johnny. I couldn't stay in business a year if i did as you asked me to the red-haired bodyguard was flushed well then i guess i'll have to do it he said in a tight defiant voice if you won't warn the colonists i will harkness jaw tightened better think it over rick his voice was still controlled and level he gripped Rick's shoulder with a pudgy, jeweled hand. Remember, those hunters trusted me. They figure my bodyguard wouldn't do anything I told them not to. If you warn the colonists, I'll have to make it clear you were on your own. His voice held a threat. What do you mean? Rick demanded, pushing the hand from his shoulder. The least I would do would be to fire you back to earth, he said ominously. Johnny drew in his breath. He knew how much Rick wanted to stay on Venus. The trader got his bodyguards by paying their way to Venus. He agreed to stake them for hunting if they did good work for a year. Otherwise, they were sent back to earth. It was said that men who crossed Trader Harkness never made it alive. I'm sorry, Trader, Rick said, but I'll take my chances. If you don't like what I do, I'll join the colony. I should have guessed it, the Trader said contemptuously. When you begin hanging around with that worthless Jeb, the trader paused, and then the threat in his voice was no longer veiled. Believe me, Saunders, join that colony, and you'll regret it. The heavy man turned slowly and moved toward his trading post. Fascinated, Johnny had all but forgotten the meat fruit in his hand. The trader was almost past him when he remembered. With a little toss, Johnny let go of the juicy fruit. For an instant, he thought he had thrown too far, but the trader waddled forward just right. With a sickening plop, the red fruit exploded on the top of Trader Harkness' shining head globe. Dripping purple globs splattered through the air slits, smearing the stone bald head a strong sweet smell floated up to johnny for a moment harkness stood perfectly still in shocked amazement then the tremendous man began to dance about in sheer rage and discomfort water he yelled his rumbling voice rising to a shrill cry Get some water. He was bouncing up and down in an odd way, 
his clenched fists hitting the air all his dignity was gone johnny stared open-mouthed awed by his own daring rick saunders stood still a second and then broke into a guffaw i tell you get me some water trader harkness roared three or four hunters and jeb the old guard came running up they took one look and they too broke into laughter jeb was carrying a fire bucket never thought i'd get this chance will jeb cackled and sloshed a bucket of water over harkness the water splashed on the bald head and washed the bits of fruit down the trader's neck and under his armor the big man stood there dumb with anger johnny's throat ached with the laughs he'd kept back he glanced up to the branch where baba sat the little bear's fur was shivering with fun his eyes opened wide and with a whirr of clicks meaning watch me johnny he leaped into space he kicked up a flurry of dust as he bounced to the ground and up to his feet in front of the trader and the other men by this time the crown had grown to a dozen men baba stopped a moment to make sure everyone was watching him then the round little bear began a dancing bouncing waddle up and down he clenched his forepaws into little fists and beat the air his face was screwed up into a mighty frown it was a perfect imitation of the trader the man's laughter swelled to a roar rick harkness voice rumbled out tight and cold with rage shoot it the laughter stopped suddenly almost as if it had been switched off it had been so long since anyone had made fun of the traitor that the man had lost his head i can't do that rick's lean brown face was horrified then he became angry i wouldn't shoot a kid's pet well i will moving with more speed than seemed a large man could muster the trader's hand snaked toward his holster baba saw the joke had gone too far he leaped into the air came down with a bounce and shot up the tree beside johnny before the trader could level the gun at him johnny's mouth went dry already the trader was searching the tree for baba his pistol up the safety switch off the men stood in shocked silence he's right beside me mr harkness johnny shouted and crawled into full view come on baba get on my shoulder he can't shoot me as johnny came into full view the trader's face grew angrier yet. Baba didn't drop that meat fruit, Mr. Harkness, Johnny said firmly. I did. Kids got guts, one of the hunters muttered. As Johnny slid down to the ground, he saw his mother pushing her way through the group of men. Her lips were tight together, her face white. You're going to get it, Baba clicked. Here come your pa and Captain Thompson, too. Mrs. Watson strode straight up to Trader Harkness, her eyes blazing. You ought to be ashamed, she said to the man. Then she turned on Johnny. And so had you, young man. No planet fall for you. Johnny's heart leaped. He'd done it at last. Now, Mr. Harkness, Johnny's mother's voice was very low. 
what baba and johnny did was very wrong i apologize for them and johnny will certainly be punished nevertheless i never want to hear of you or anyone else threatening baba again is that clear taken aback the trader nodded that goes for the whole family mr harkness johnny's father stepped forward straight and tall and put his arm around his wife's shoulder not to mention the colony he went on we have a pretty big stake in that bear the fat short trader suddenly seemed as cold as ice his heavy jaw thrust out and his little black eyes looked straight at johnny's father valuable or not i don't have to put up with insults not from those two or any of you if that's the kind of thanks i get for ten years of working with you i'm through you can fight your own battles now he jerked his head around toward rick come on i'm staying the young man said all right stay a smooth bald head swiveled back to the watson family i told this man i'd fire him back to earth but let him stay after the hunters have picked your bones i'll take care of him he turned and with heavy footsteps walked away his slow waddle did not seem funny now the hunters in the crowd stood for a moment and then followed him captain thompson addressed johnny's father that sounded like a declaration of war johnny's father nodded grimly i think our colony is getting too big for him he said slowly he's been looking for a way to break with us and johnny gave him just the kind of excuse he needed yep said jeb but don't be too hard on johnny maybe it's just as good it happened now when we got marva claus to buy us some extra firepower you might not have those claws long enough to do any good rick saunders cut in i was just going to warn you four hunters just ask harkness in on a plan to rob the stockade the trader turned em down but which four hunters captain thompson broke in a shadow passed over rick's face i don't know which ones he looked at mr watson eagerly i want to help though i'm hoping you'll take me on as a guard we can sure use you jeb stepped up and slapped the young man on the back mr watson appeared to consider for a moment he looked rick up and down and then glanced at captain thompson who nodded all right rick he said you go on over to the guard barracks and jeb'll check you out when you're through report to captain thompson rick saunders grinned old jeb threw an arm around his shoulder and they walked off together when they were out of hearing captain thompson turned to johnny's father i don't know if i like this he said harkness may have planted that man on us i'm certainly not going to let him get anywhere near our claws i'll keep an eye on saunders personally but gosh johnny broke in i heard him ar i think johnny said his father sternly you've said and done enough for one day the traitor is a proud man and by making a fool of him you've given the colony a deadly enemy he turned back to captain thompson we'd better change our plans captain it looks like we should double maybe even triple the guard 
End of chapter 3「Four of Venus Boy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Venus Boy by Lee Sutton. Chapter Four. The Third Secret. Three hours later, Boy and Bear were trudging through the marshberry fields toward new plymouth rock johnny's bottom was still warm from his recent session with a strap the boy was in full armor a leather harness was strapped to the little bear's furry blue back the last copter had long since left for the rocket field and except for guards the settlement was nearly empty because of this johnny had been forbidden to leave his house a lone person without a gun was supposed to be just what the arrow birds were looking for but johnny wasn't afraid he had his third secret johnny reached up and carefully picked one of the apple-sized marsh berries for himself it was a rich ripe yellow color they're just right this year johnny said to baba the little bear nodded gravely both he and johnny had worked hard in those fields everyone did marsh berries prevented a disease called colds that johnny had never had and were the only crop the colonists could send back to earth they had to be ripe for the yearly rocket or a year's work was wasted johnny trudged on under the weight of his armor while baba bounced along beside him a mile away loomed new primeth's rock a huge mesa-like rock made up one corner of the settlement's barrier against the animals the thick concrete walls of the settlement topped with live wires were joined to the rock on two sides on its summit stood a stunted diamond wood tree this was johnny's and baba's destination baba jumped high in the air made himself into a ball and bounded on ahead hurry up he clicked hungry for nuts huh johnny asked crunchy ones the little bear clicked back turning a somersault in the air come on hurry johnny made a face at baba bear he said you're certainly getting bossy lately baba did another somersault bounced and landed on johnny's shoulder with a thump almost knocking the boy down he put his nose in Johnny's ear. I'm a grown-up, he clicked in heavy tones. Hear my beautiful new voice? Johnny hunched his shoulders hard, spilling Baba to the ground. Then he grabbed him by the harness and stood up. While Baba squeaked piteously, Johnny swung him round and round. At the top of one of the swings, he let go, tossing Baba high into the air. Help! Help! clicked Baba, beating paws into the air and screwing up his face. Just before he hit the ground, he made himself into a ball. He hit with a smack and bounced higher than Johnny had thrown him. Both of them were laughing when he stopped bouncing. Gosh, I wish we could have done that for the Earthies, Johnny said. The two fell silent, both thinking of the fun they were missing at the rocket field. They were coming to the end of the marshberry fields. Before them were the great boulders surrounding New Plymouth Rock. Johnny had made the harness Baba was wearing 
for forays among the boulders forbidden forays for arrow birds nested there baba with his strong nails and bouncy body could go straight up the face of rocks he was small enough to ride on johnny's shoulder but he was powerful too by hanging on to baba's harness johnny could go straight up and over large boulders armor and all let's go right by the nests baba clicked i want to be sure right off okay worry bear you lead the way johnny began to chant grandpapa bobby sat in a corner afraid that his shadow would burn in the fire baba bounced over the smaller rocks in the way johnny weighed down with his head globe and armor made his way slowly over them and between them baba helped johnny over one steep place and then stayed beside him it was hard going and johnny's clothes were drenched with sweat under his armor before they clambered down the last boulder and on to a little flat place they were already high above the level of the settlement on one side they were surrounded by high red boulders on the other side loomed the sheer cliff of new plymouth rock far above them from many round holes in the rock came strange squeaking sounds here were the arrow bird nests johnny was deathly afraid he'd seen what an arrow bird could do when it shot itself at a man get ready baba he whispered those are just babies up there baba clicked no danger yet let's climb up and get rid of them johnny suggested then there won't be any here to no bobby interrupted but why i'd be protected by my armor and no baba clicked more firmly there was a stern but puzzled expression on the little bear's face the arrow birds are my friend pets i must not hurt them he used a word in the clicking language which meant both friend and pet it was something like the word kickack which he called johnny friend pet brother all right johnny said but i don't understand you mustn't harm them either baba said remember i brought you here otherwise you wouldn't know where the nests were even if you just tell the grown-ups and they kill them well it would be wrong i would have baba was interrupted by a high whistling shrieking noise and the whir of wings so quick you couldn't have followed his motions johnny squatted down curled his feet under him thrust his hands and forearms into special armor pockets six strangely shaped creatures were diving straight at him arrow birds a dirty greenish yellow they were long and slender over a foot long one could not tell where their heads left off and their necks began they were shaped like long arrow points their gossamer thin wings were a blur of motion johnny braced himself so that if they hit him he would not be knocked over in a fraction of a second they dived within fifty feet of him go away friend pets baba clicked as loudly and fast as he could go away bother us not he repeated his cry in a kind of chant so rapidly it was almost a trill the shrieking whistle changed to a low hum the arrow birds pulled out of their dive they floated in mid-air their wings a horror 
One had almost reached Johnny and was hovering in the air only a couple of yards away. It bent its neck out of arrow position and looked straight at him. Its little purple eyes glittered against the yellow-green skin of its head. Then, like a flash, they were gone. Phew, Johnny breathed. He took his hands out of his arbor and stood up. He turned around just in time to see the flight of arrow birds crawl into the holes in the rocks that were their nests. This was Johnny's third secret. The arrow birds obeyed Baba. Right after Baba's voice had changed and his jewel claws had come in, the two had made this astonishing discovery. They had stumbled upon this nesting place, and the arrow birds, frightened for their nests, had slashed down at Johnny for the first time in his life. But Baba had cried out desperately in his new deep clicks for them to go away. And they had. It was like magic. Staring up at the sheer cliff, Johnny was excited, but afraid. Such a climb was too dangerous to do just for the fun of it, but Johnny thought he might have a way of saving Baba. Even when they were much younger, the little bear had been willing to leave Johnny in order to climb for diamondwood nuts fresh from the tree. It was an ideal place for Baba to hide. If Johnny could climb up with him, they would be able to visit often, and Baba was so fond of fresh nuts, he might be willing to use it for a hideout. Johnny hadn't told Baba about his plan. If they could make it to the top, he would tell the bear then. The high shrieking whistle began again. Johnny suddenly had an idea. Friend pets, friend pets, bother me not, bother me not, Johnny clicked quickly, shaping deep clicks just like Baba's in the back of his throat. As the birds half pulled out of their dive, the little bear started to speak. No, let me keep trying, Johnny clicked. Friend pets, friend pets, bother me not. At this... The birds hovered about him, making squeaking noises, their heads still in a striking position. They're puzzled, Baba clicked. They sense something's wrong. They expect to be shot at by people. I'll tell them to go, and it'll be all right. In a second, they could kill you. I've still got my armor, said Johnny. Maybe if I tell them to come here, they'll trust me. Johnny spoke at last in English, and the words sent the birds fluttering farther away. They seemed to be on the point of making another dive. Johnny was pale under his head globe, but clicked. Friend pets, come to your friend. The flying lizards slowly quieted squeaking among themselves their wings humming they hovered closer and closer there were five of them finally their heads snapped out of arrow position one of them hovered in very close come to me friend pet johnny clicked to it and held out his hand the creature watching him carefully with its little purple eyes floated even nearer, its wings humming. Very gingerly, it came to a perch on his hand. Its claws were cold, and it smelled faintly of meat fruit. Johnny breathed deep. He was the only human being who had ever made friends with an arrow bird. Slowly, while the other birds hovered in the air about him, Johnny drew in his hand and stroked the bird on its folded wings. It shivered under his touch, but 
as he did it no harm, the other birds came closer and lit on his arms and his shoulders. One peered into his face, another poked the air slits of Johnny's head globe with its sharp bill. Baba, Baba, Johnny cried out, do you see this? Do you think I could sneak one home with us? Your people would kill him, Johnny, Baba clicked. Go away, friend pet, he clicked to the arrow bird. The bird looked at Johnny. Go, friend pets, Johnny clicked regretfully to the five birds about him. With a flash of wings, they were gone. Gosh, said Johnny, gosh. He unzipped and wriggled out of his armor. Baba, I don't have to wear armor ever any more. Do you understand? I can just walk around like you do. The words fairly bubbled out of him. Baba was quiet for a moment, frowning. Johnny, he clicked, I've done something wrong, something very bad. I'm not sure why, but I just know it's wrong. Those are my friend pets, not yours. If you use the word friend pet to them, that means you can never hurt them. You must always help them, but they will always try to kill your mother and father. It's all mixed up. Gee, Baba, Johnny was frowning now, too. Come on, let's try the climb and forget it. From one of the armor straps, he unhooked a flashlight he always brought along for exploring caves. He fastened it to his belt. A few moments later, the two friends were looking up at the bare rock face that extended three hundred feet straight up. Golly, Baba, do you really think you can take us up there? Johnny asked. If you can hold on, I can take you, Baba said from Johnny's shoulder. Start up, Johnny yelled. Baba leaped up onto the wall of rock, his claws cutting into it. Johnny grasped the harness and hooked his toes into a crack in the stone. End of chapter 4「his arms were about to be pulled from his shoulders. The boy helped push with his feet, but that took only a little weight from his arms. Below him there was nothing but boulders and sharp, jagged rocks. In spite of that danger, he felt that he could hardly keep hold of the harness. Sweat poured down into his eyes. Hurry, Baba, he said through clenched teeth. Ledge soon, the little bear clicked. As he speeded up his climb, he slapped his claws deep into the rock, making sharp clapping noises that echoed among the boulders below. He stopped short, and Jotty saw a place where the rock jutted out a few inches. Gratefully, he felt something solid beneath his feet. He couldn't put his whole foot down, but he could rest his arms a little. Phew, Johnny said. Doesn't the ledge get wider? In a minute, Baba answered. Crabwise, with Johnny still hanging on, Baba worked along the ledge, which slowly widened until Johnny could stand alone. They were now 
on the jungle side of the rock. A few feet farther on, there was a narrow slit in the rock face that widened into a small cave. Deep in the cave's darkness, Johnny heard the squeaking of young arrow birds. As he crept inside, he whipped his flashlight from his belt. Purple eyes glittered at him in the circle of its light. There was a flutter of wings. Johnny and Baba started to click at the same time. The fluttering stopped, and the birds' heads disappeared into their nests. The cave ended in a pile of large stones. Johnny sat down. Boy, do my arms ache, Johnny said. How about you, Baba? I can climb, Baba answered. But can you hold on? We have far to go. Aren't there any more ledges? Johnny asked. Small ones, Baba answered. None are wide like this one. Do you still want to go up? Maybe we could tie me on some way, Johnny said. Mountain climbers do it that way. In a moment, the boy and the bear were trying to see what they could work out. Finally, Johnny had Baba use the razor-sharp point of one of his claws to cut a pair of long, thin straps from the wide ones on the harness. These they tied to Johnny's belt and then to Baba's harness again. When the straps were finished, Johnny felt rested, and they started out of the cave. They were stopped by the sight below them. At the foot of the rock, there was a wide space of cleared ground, and then the jungle stretched out. About a half mile away, some large grayish beasts were breaking out of the undergrowth. Rhinosaurs, Johnny shouted, pointing. Golly, a whole herd of them. There were more than thirty of the huge gray-blue saurians. Even at that distance they could hear the low thunder of the gigantic hoofs. The beasts stayed close to the brush, knocking down small trees as they came. Johnny knew that heavy auto-tubes were trained on the rhinosaurs from the guard towers. The guards in the gate towers would have a full view of them. Johnny also knew that unless the beasts began to charge the walls, the guards would not fire. If they did, the whole herd might charge. Topped as they were with electric wires, the heavy fifty-foot-high walls would be hard to breach. But rhinosaurs had smashed those walls once, before they were thickened and electrified. Remember when they attacked and killed a lot of colonists? I remember, Baba clicked. Your people killed them, too. These straps, Johnny nodded because it was made of the skin of an animal the colonists had killed. He had a hard time getting Baba to wear that harness. Let's go, Johnny said. This time the going was not so hard for Johnny, though they climbed much farther before he and Baba could rest. The next ledge they reached was not large enough to let them sit. Baba had to hang on to the rock, but it didn't seem to tire him. Three more rests, and slowly but surely they were reaching the top. At the last rest, Baba clicked to Johnny in warning. The rock is getting softer. If my claws tear away from the rock, just relax and fall with me. I'll grab again further down. All right, he said. Johnny didn't dare look down. He had been climbing with Baba since he was three, but never this high before. They had gone up only a few more feet when Baba's claws began to slip. Johnny let himself go limp just in case.
case anything happened. Very slowly, Baba's claws slipped down the rock. Then they caught hold again. We will have to move to the side, Baba clicked. Johnny didn't answer. It was up to Baba. The little bear scuttled crabwise along the side until he found rock that didn't scale off. Then up they went again. Finally, there was a ledge. The two scrambled onto it. Above the ledge was a gap in the rock, some boulders, and they were on the top. A faint wind was blowing, and Johnny could hear it sing through the top of a stunted diamond wood tree growing on the summit. The top of New Plymouth Rock was flat, a hundred feet or more wide, but with many jutting boulders. Here and there grew small bushes and patches of grass. The diamond wood tree sprang directly from the bare rock. With shaking fingers, Johnny untied the straps and threw himself down on a patch of green. As he lay there, his breath rustling the grass, he heard Baba pattering about and wondered how the little bear had so much energy left. Johnny, Baba clicked, do you want some berries? Johnny looked up to see the little bear holding some clear, almost transparent red berries in his paw. The colonists called them antelope berries because they grew mainly in antelope country. At that moment, Johnny realized he was very thirsty. Thanks, Baba. He crushed the berries with his teeth and felt the sour sweet juice trickle down his throat. He suddenly felt thrilled with triumph. He was now where no other human had ever been before. Johnny was just raising his head to look around him when he heard the patter of tiny hoofs behind him. Look, Johnny, Baba clicked. Johnny turned. Running toward him was a herd of the tiniest antelope he had ever seen. They were barely six inches high, their curled horns almost as tiny as needles. Head down, they charged directly at him. Johnny jumped to his feet. Friend pets, Baba clicked gently, bother us not. The tiny creatures wheeled about and started back in the direction from which they had come. Oh, Baba, don't send them away, Johnny said. Then, remembering his success with the arrow birds, he himself clicked in a low tone. Come here, friend pets, come here. The antelope, with the longest curled blue horns, stopped turned slowly around and pawed the ground. His long neck arched. It was just seven inches high. Johnny laughed. The regular antelope were seven feet high, but otherwise looked exactly the same as these. Johnny squatted down, and as he moved, the herd turned and ran, making little whinnying noises. Then they wheeled and returned. The leader pranced closer and closer and came to a halt within a foot of Johnny. It was soft blue all over, marked with spots of deeper purple. Its tiny hooves were blue-black, and its eyes glistened with deep purple highlights. Johnny reached out both his hands and laid them before the little creature. Come, Johnny clicked. Trembling, the little antelope pawed the grass. Then, with mincing steps, he came forward and placed his forefeet on one hand, his hind feet on the other. Very slowly, Johnny raised him from the ground. The small hooves were sharp, 
and dug in to the palms of his hands. The little animal's eyes widened, and it snorted in fear. Johnny, afraid it might fall, sent his hands back on the ground. Go, friend pet, he clicked. With a bound, the creature returned to his herd. Together, the antelope leaped high over a small boulder and were gone behind a clump of bushes. Johnny looked up to see Baba watching him steadily. The little bear looked at Johnny the same way as when he had spoken to the arrow birds. Friend, pet, brother Johnny, Baba clicked. I am sure I am doing wrong. First the arrow birds, and now the antelopes are your friends, but they are your people's enemies. Not the antelopes, Johnny said. They fight us some, but we don't ever bother them except for meat. Your people killed them, Bobby said, as if that settled matters. Now you can't. You've said they were your friends. Is that some kind of rule? Johnny asked. You said they were your friends, Baba repeated. You helped your friends, and your friends helped you. That is the law, and will be the law, as the trees stand. Between friend and friend, there is no parting more than the fingers of a hand. Baba said this in a sort of sing-song of clicks, like the song of a bird. It was something like a poem. Baba, Johnny asked, how do you know all this? You've never talked this way before. Johnny squatted down before the little bear, whose face was screwed up into a puzzled frown. I guess I've always known it, Baba clicked, but it just came back to me. I don't remember much before I came to live with you, Johnny, but I do remember being in a high tree. There was one like me whom I loved very much, and she sang the song I just sang to you. I remember going to sleep while she sang it. It is a true song, too. Would you sing it again? Johnny asked. The little bear began again. You help your friends, and your friends help you. It is the law, and will be the law, as the trees stand. Between friend and friend, there is no parting, more than the fingers of a hand. This time the little bear really sang, trilling the clicks to a tune like the roll of a mockingbird song. Johnny felt very strange. He patted Baba on the head and then stood up. I think I understand, he said, and looked out over the surrounding countryside, thinking about the little antelope he had just held in his hands. I'm hungry, the little bear clicked. With a jump and a bounce, he started for the stunted diamond wood tree. Baba, Johnny called. The little bear bounced back. Aren't there plenty of those nuts here for you to live on? I mean, enough to feed you regularly if you lived here all the time? The little bear nodded, yes, but frowned. I want to live with you, Johnny, he clicked. I know, Baba, but you're in danger. I hope that if I could show you, I'd be able to visit you. Maybe you'd stay. At the unhappiness on the little bear's face, Johnny hurried on. Look, Baba, I can't make you stay here. But somebody's going to find out about your nails if you stay with me. If you live here, I could come up and visit you when the nights come. And if we were lucky, I could see you most every week time down by the rocks. Johnny's voice trailed off. Baba was looking unhappier and unhappier. I want to live with you, Baba repeated. 
Remember what the song says about parting. You stay here with me. It was Johnny's turn to look unhappy. He didn't want to leave his father and mother any more than Baba wanted to leave him. The hard climb was all for nothing. I can't, Baba. You know that, he said sadly. I can't either, Baba said. Johnny continued arguing for a long time, but it did no good. Baba wanted to be with Johnny. There wasn't anything more to say. I'm still hungry, clicked the little bear plaintively. Then, with a bounce, Baba was up and away. The little bear was crazier about fresh diamond wood nuts than anything else, even chocolate. Johnny felt sad and confused. He got up. Below him stretched the sweet green lands of Venus. The hard angles of the walls and the squat gray buildings of the settlements were somehow out of keeping with the rest of the land. There was an almost park-like look about the jungle from this height. In the distance, the towering groves of diamondwood trees where the marva lived shone blue-green against the light green clouds that were the skies of venus between the blue groves of diamond wood were the meadowlands soft and rolling at the edges of the meadows were the lower and darker green meat trees where the saber-toothed leopards stalked the land was leased with rivers that shone in the green light. It was all so beautiful and so deadly. In a few hours evening would begin, almost three earth days of twilight. Venus turned so slowly that there was a whole earth week, each of daylight and dark. But of course, people had to sleep and work by earth days. The thick Permanent clouds surrounded Venus, glowed with light hours after sundown, making the twilight last and last. Beyond the marshes was the sea, filled, too, with savage life, flying crocodiles who made nests of the bones of their prey, great dinosaur-like monsters and shark snakes, but none of these dared come on to the land, for the land animals fought them as fiercely as they fought man. Except for Baba, all the animals on Venus were determined to kill Johnny's people, and he had just been making friends with some of those enemies. He felt strange, as if he were being a traitor to his own kind. Johnny didn't like that feeling. Suddenly, he thought of Baba living among people and wondered if the little bear felt the same way. Johnny turned away from the edge of the cliff and kicked a stone. He began to wander over the top of New Plymouth Rock, peering into bushes and piles of boulders. He passed near the antelopes grazing on some grass. They lifted their heads and whinnied, but went on grazing. Johnny liked that. Beside a pile of small boulders, he found some arrow bird nests. He spoke to the birds, and all was well. That's an odd pile of boulders, Johnny muttered to himself. It didn't look just right, somehow pushed one of the stones, and it rolled down almost to his foot. There was a dark, empty space beyond it. He took his flashlight from his belt and shined it down into the opening. He almost dropped the flashlight. The light revealed the shape of a bouncing bear, a marva, just like 
Baba. Baba, Johnny turned and yelled, Come here, quick. When he looked back, the bear in the opening had not moved. It was not blue, but the color of the rock. Johnny stopped shaking. The opening was the entrance into a cave, and on the wall of the cave was carved the figure of a bear he had thought was alive. But he was sure that the bear had been blue. End of chapter 5、6、of Venus Boy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Venus Boy by Lee Sutton. Chapter 6 Inside New Plymouth Rock. Johnny and Baba excitedly started clearing away the pile of boulders and stones from the mouth of the mysterious cave. Immediately the arrow birds began flying around, their heads snapping into striking position. They don't like us doing this, Baba clicked. They don't like it at all. He turned to the fluttering birds. Bother us not, bother us not, he repeated. The birds retreated, but hovered in the air not far off. Go away, Johnny clicked. The birds squeaked among themselves and went a little farther away. I don't understand, Johnny said. We aren't bothering their nests. He and Baba each picked up a stone and carried it away from the cave opening. Johnny watched the arrow birds from the corners of his eyes. They dived in closer. Go away, came a firm, deep click. The birds stopped in midair and then were gone. Gosh, Johnny said to Baba, you sure made them go that time. Baba's eyes opened wide. I didn't say anything, he clicked. The bear and the boy looked at one another, puzzled, and then into the opening. The bear cut in the stone. Was all they could see. Come on, Baba. Johnny rushed to the opening and knocked down a few more stones. Baba pushed them farther away. In a few minutes of hard work, the opening was big enough for Johnny to squeeze through. Around the edge of the cave, the rock was carved with the shapes of many animals. The floor slanted sharply downward. Hurry, Johnny, Baba clicked anxiously. He may have gone away. The little bear's eyes were shining with the eagerness. Johnny's heart sank. Baba had not seen another live jewel bear since he had been captured. He had never seemed interested, but now he was quivering with excitement. If they found Marva, maybe Baba. Would want to stay with them. Johnny wanted Baba to be safe, but he didn't want to lose him for always. The little bear was already scurrying down the steep slope. Without stopping to think of danger ahead, Johnny plunged after him. The ceiling was just high enough for him to stand upright. Flashing his light into the darkness, Johnny saw. That the cave was a long passageway that curved down into the heart of the great rock. Soon they were too deep inside for any light to reach them from the mouth of the cave. Except for the beam of Johnny's flashlight, they were surrounded by complete darkness. The air was musty and cool, and their footfalls echoed. Making scary hollow noises. Stop, Johnny said. He held his fingers to his lips. His words echoed and re echoed in front of them. Then 
there was almost silence. A soft padding and clicking sound came from far in the distance. It was the same kind of noise Baba's feet and claws made on stone. The two started out again at a half run. The slope was almost too steep, and Johnny had to slide to a halt to keep from falling. Baba went bouncing along ahead and out of sight. As the slope became steeper yet, Johnny had to slide forward carefully. He stumbled and went down on his back. His flashlight slipped from his hand and went rolling on down the passage and out of sight. In a second, it was pitch black. Baba, Johnny yelled at the top of his lungs. His only answer was his own voice echoing down the long corridor. He pushed himself up into a sitting position and slid on forward on the seat of his pants, his heart beating rapidly. A few very long minutes later, he saw a light shining in the distance. It was Baba, the flashlight in his paw. Hurry, Johnny, he clicked. Hurry. With the way lighted for him, Johnny got to his feet and could move faster. As he reached Baba, the passage began to widen, and the slope became less steep. I saw him, Baba clicked excitedly. He was big. I'm sure if we could catch him, he'd be a friend. I tried to talk to him, but he went on ahead, just when you called out, Oh, Johnny, I do want to find him. Johnny had never seen Baba so excited. Suddenly, the passageway ended, and they were in a great underground room. Johnny flashed his light around the walls. They, too, were carved with scenes of life on Venus. Beneath each carving was a small doorway leading into a side room. There was one large doorway opposite the one through which they had entered. It looks like a meeting house, Johnny said, with seats and everything. He flashed his light on one of the carvings. He had heard of carvings like these and had seen one once. His father said, that they must have been made by an intelligent life form that had visited Venus from the stars. This cave must have been where they had hidden from the animals, just as men now hid from them behind the settlement's great walls. Johnny was awed. Johnny, don't just stand there, Baba clicked. We've got to find him. Johnny looked from opening to opening. Which way, Baba? The little bear sniffed the air. I can't tell, he said. I can't tell. Hurriedly, they made a circle about the great room. When they came to the large opening, Baba sniffed carefully. Maybe here, he clicked and plunged through. Down they went, as before. This time, Johnny grabbed Baba's harness, and they were able to move faster. This corridor was just as steep and curving as the first one. In a few minutes, they emerged into another room. It was smaller than the room above, and had three small doorways and one large opening. Let's try them all, Baba said. Through each of the three small doorways, they entered similar rooms. The fourth opening was another corridor. Again, Baba thought he smelled the path of the marble. Down that corridor they went, down and down. Finally, it ended in hundreds of rooms, large and small. The rock was like a honeycomb. Johnny's flashlight was already growing dim and they didn't dare try to search much longer. 
trying to follow the scent they took a side corridor that led from one small room to another and came out into a narrow passageway a faint light glimmered at the end of it baba bounded on ahead johnny running to keep up with him the light seeped through a pile of rocks johnny flashed his light through one of the cracks behind the pile of rocks the tunnel continued for several feet in the light of his flashlight johnny could see bits of leather on the floor of the outer part of the cave just beyond them on the other side of the rocks was the cave johnny and baba had rested in while climbing up the cave in which they had cut the long straps they had used to tie themselves together for the long climb upward the bits of leather on the floor were scraps that had been left over why we're almost to the bottom johnny said yes baba clicked i guess we can't find him i don't smell anything now but arrow birds he ended sadly we gotta try johnny said firmly he felt hollow inside when he thought baba might go away for good but he was convinced now that this was the only way to keep him safe let's try farther down johnny turned around and a few minutes later they were going down one of the curving main corridors again this corridor gradually straightened out soon it slanted down at all it finally turned into what seemed to be a long underground tunnel johnny had to stoop over to keep from hitting his head on the ceiling the passageway was no longer going through solid rock and its walls and floor were a sticky clay johnny's and baba's feet made squishing noises as they walked it seemed as if the tunnel would never end they walked on and on i think we're going away from new plymouth rock baba clicked i think so too johnny answered we must have already gone most a mile the walls had narrowed until johnny and baba had to walk single file suddenly the passageway slanted upward and a faint glow of light could be seen far away as they began to climb toward the light the ceiling became so low johnny had to crawl on his hands and knees it was a long sticky climb as they approached within a few yards of the light baba stopped blocking johnny's way this cave must end up in the jungle outside the colony wall the little bear clicked maybe we ought to stop he sounded worried but johnny was not going to let this chance pass go on he urged but the rhinosaurs who's afraid of an old rhinosaur johnny demanded you are baba clicked but he scrambled on they emerged into the blinding light in the center of a tangle of thick high brush they were out in the jungle far away from the rock the boy and his bear were covered with mud from head to foot they peered carefully around listening in the distance they could hear the rumble of moving rhinosaurs as they crept away from the cave their view continued to be blocked by large bushes and trees they couldn't even see new plymouth rock stepping quietly and carefully they finally came to an opening in the brush far to the right was the rock and farther in the distance a guard tower get back johnny shouted the guard'll see us the two jumped back there was a grunt behind them they turned behind a screen of brush 
a great blue-scaled rhinosaur was waking up. It was between them and the opening to the cave. It snorted to the sound of a deep bass drum and heaved up on its feet. Ahead, at the edge of the clearing, was a tall meat tree. They had two chances. They could turn quietly and creep away into the brush, hoping the big beast would not see or hear them. Or they could make a run for the meat tree in full view of the guard tower. End of chapter 6